Now I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Gordon. Thank you and enjoy the program. Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed the other programs on Circe. It's been so great to see uh, that there are so many people in Kansas reading the novel and um, gearing up to read Madeline Miller's other book and um, coming to the performance by Stanley Lombardo. So um, I've made a video so that we don't have to worry about any technical glitches. So we'll, we'll just show the video. Um, and it's, it's all about Greek vase painting, um, painting on Greek pots from around um, 2,500 years ago. And um, I would love to hear some questions after the video. So let's just jump right in and have the video now. Thank you. This video is an introduction to the depiction of the goddess Circe in 6th and 5th century Attic vase painting. Attic vase painting is a term we use for Athenian painting on pottery, and I'm talking about the 6th and 5th centuries BC or BCE, in other words, around at least two and a half millennia ago. The terracotta pelike or jar we see here is in the style we call Attic red figure, with red figures on black background. As you can see, this style inspired the cover of Miller's novel, Circe. Homer's Odyssey was already in existence when these clay vessels were crafted, but the painters and owners of the pots most likely knew the story of Circe and Odysseus, not from reading, but from hearing the poem recited by professional performers. The vase painters who knew how to write sometimes labeled their paintings with the names of mythological figures, but usually we rely on our understanding of iconography, a traditional visual language of images or symbols. Thus, a woman stirring something in a cup for an alarmed man who is turned partway into a pig has to be Circe with one of Odysseus's men. By the way, some of the vase painters and potters signed their work, but usually modern scholars have to make up names for painters. The painter of this jar is called the Ethiop painter because a similar jar that looks like it was painted by the same artist includes a painting of an Ethiopian. One of the many things I love about the novel Circe is the attention paid to the sound of Circe's voice. In Homer, Circe is Kirke el Plokomos Dene Theos Aldeasa. In Lombardo's translation, Circe, a dread goddess with a richly coiled hair and a human voice. The mysterious designation dread goddess speaking with human voice is one that Circe shares with Calypso, the other famous nymph visited by Odysseus. For me, the Circe painted here seems a little too human, although her pharmacon is clearly working its magic. Pharmacon is the word both Homer and Miller use for the concoction that Circe prepares to work her shape-changing spells. Circe also looks very human on this wine jug, which may be roughly contemporary with the jar we've been looking at. The slide shows two slides of the same pot. On the right, we recognize Circe by her cup and the implement we might regard as both swizzle stick and magic wand. On the left, we see an armed Odysseus who, as a traveler, is often identified with a hat. The hat pushed back from his head must be attached with a thong. Interestingly, this vase is also from Nola, near Naples in Italy. The Etruscans were great importers of Greek pottery, which they used to furnish their tombs. Sometimes the pots found in tombs show signs of careful mending jobs, so perhaps this wine jug was used at parties where the drinkers made sardonic remarks about the power of the wine, or took Circe's image as a visual warning not to drink too much. But now I'd like to jump back in time to an earlier style of painting called Attic Black Figure. This kylix, or wine cup, is dated to somewhere after the middle of the 6th century BCE, possibly around 550 or 525. To the left of center, we see Circe stirring her pharmacon, or potion, into the cup of a man who is right in the process of turning into a pig. Notice that the pig man facing Circe still has his hands, so we can imagine him being able to drink from the cup. The other pigmen already have hooves. The man running off at the far left at the cup's handle is in the process of changing into a lion. The domestic dog underneath the cup may be an indicator of Circe's human-like aspects, 
Susie keeps a dog. We don't know the real name of the artist, who is called the painter of the Boston Polyphemus, after this pot. The other side of the pot includes a damaged painting of the Cyclops Polyphemus. The term name vase indicates that this vase is how the painter got the name. Notice that I'm not willing to say his name. Most painters may have been male, but we do have some evidence for female artisans. One fact about artistic convention here. These early Greek artists who painted in the style we call black figure used a gender-based system adopted from Egyptian art in which female figures were painted white and males were painted black. This technique involved first painting both male and female figures in black silhouette, then adding white paint to female figures after firing. The white paint was less durable, so our Circe has survived mostly as the black silhouette. She would have originally been white, like the goddess Athena in this slide on the right. If you look at Circe's thighs, you can see the remnants of white paint. Close examination reveals no evidence of any clothing. Circe is naked. To give you a better idea of the usual gender-based skin color system, here's a closer look at Athena on this black figure lekythos or oil flask from around the year 500 BCE. By the way, the painter has carefully labeled Athena and the two male warriors Achilles and Ajax. In the vertical inscriptions, we even get the soundtrack. Achilles is saying, I have four, while Ajax is saying, I have two. They're playing a game. Back to Circe. The painter of the Boston Polyphemus seems to admire literacy, but if we try to read this writing, it doesn't make sense. The painter wanted to give the illusion of writing, but the inscriptions are apparently just nonsense words. The overall effect is actually convincing, though. The cup is only around five inches tall, so it would have been hard for most users to read it. But what about Circe's lack of clothing? Here's what Professor Alan Shapiro has to say. Her nudity is rather startling and not altogether easy to explain. Surely, if the Homeric Circe had appeared at her doorstep in the nude to invite the men in, this would have merited comment. At this period of Greek art, female nudity is very rare and generally means only one thing, the tyri or professional prostitutes. The painter, looking ahead, knew that Circe will straight away take Odysseus to her bed, a gesture of sexual forwardness unthinkable for a respectable Greek woman. Perhaps the nudity was his way of translating that side of her nature into visual terms immediately recognizable. It was a bold gesture that later painters would not repeat. Professor Shapiro takes Circe's nudity as a sort of shorthand for something that is about to happen in the story. As you know, from the Odyssey, our hero Odysseus is going to drink Circe's potion, but he will not turn into a pig because the god Hermes has secretly supplied him with the protective herb moly. Hermes instructs Odysseus to have sex with Circe and learn from her everything he needs to know about his upcoming ordeals. In the Odyssey, Odysseus's men meet Circe before he does, and Circe transforms some of Odysseus' men into swine before a man named Eurylochus imagines to escape and to run to Odysseus to report the horrible news. I'm not satisfied with Professor Shapiro's discussion of Circe's lack of clothing, but I love the way he describes how the painter gives us a peculiar telescoping of multiple stages of the story. In the center, we've got Circe in action, surrounded by men of various stages of metamorphosis, to the right, a man who must be Eurylochus is running to tell Odysseus, who is already entering on the left. To quote Shapiro again, the effect is a little bit like a French farce in which one character exits stage right at the very instant another enters left in impossibly perfect timing. Let's look at another black figure vase, in this case a lekythos or oil flask attributed to the Athena painter. It's hard to find good photos of this vase, but you can see that Circe is clothed like a Greek woman, and the white paint has flaked off her face and forearms. This painting is much less ambitious, but again, the painter does a wonderful job of depicting a man at the left who's in the process of turning into a pig. Even better, we know that the man seated on the rock about to receive Circe's pharmacon, notice the magic wand slash sizzle stick, must be Odysseus because of his relaxed posture. Notice his casually crossed 
pig men with hooves instead of hands are fleeing behind Circe, who's seated on a rock. This must be Odysseus entering at the right. If you look carefully around Circe's knees, the painter has indicated the inefficacy of Circe's pharmacon on this newcomer by having her drop the wine cup. Circe's hands are open in a gesture of shock, and the tilting cup is about to fall to the ground. Now I want to move forward in time to a red figure bowl or crater, this time in New York. Now the lower band has an unidentified mythological scene, but the upper band we have Odysseus, notice the hat, not on his head, but hanging back behind his head from a strap, chasing Circe, who's running off to the right. This Circe is a little too flustered for my taste, but notice that the Persephone painter used the image of the dropped cup with mixing wand to indicate Circe's lack of power over Odysseus. Another red figure, Lechithos, now in Germany, also displays the technique with the dropped cup and stick. Let's zoom in a little. But this Circe preserves her dignity. Remember, in the Odyssey and in the novel, Circe knows exactly who Odysseus is because Hermes had told her to expect him. For Odysseus, Circe will become a divine protectress who tells him how to get to the underworld and back. Let's look at the cup in Boston again with the naked Circe. To understand why this Circe is naked, I think we have to be open to some really interesting, suggestive, speculative scholarship. But I'll start with something that's not speculative, a fact you know if you started the novel. Circe's name means hawk or falcon. In name, she is a bird of prey. Another fact that is not speculative is that Greek goddesses were often associated with birds. If you've read the Odyssey, you know that Athena is good at turning into a bird. But to understand the nakedness of Circe, you need to be open to speculation about someone we call the Patnia Theron, which is Greek for mistress of the animals. The Patnia Theron is a Greek goddess or an aspect of several goddesses with ancient Near Eastern connections. This mistress of the animals seems to survive in some Greek images of the goddess Artemis in particular. On this attic red figure bell crater attributed to the pan painter, we see Artemis as a dread assault goddess attacking the hunter, Actaeon. Embracing speculation, I'm gonna jump back now in time over a millennium to an ancient Near Eastern, in this case Syrian, cylinder seal on the right, to the modern impression on the left. Um, this tiny seal, which dates to around 1700 BCE, is less than an inch tall, and it may have served to seal official documents, but to the owner, it may also have had magical properties. In this close-up of the modern impression, you can see on the left a storm god in what they call smiting pose, standing on two mountains. In the center, a winged goddess holds two spears or javelins. Her clothing is open, fully revealing her torso and one leg. To her left is a bull, and to her right is a lion's head. To a Greek, this winged goddess is an ancestress of sorts to the Patnia Theron, mistress of the animals. Scholars used to claim that such goddesses are naked or partly naked because they are fertility symbols, but lots of us are convinced that the goddess's nakedness is a sign of her power. To cross her would be hazardous, but when she's on your side, she is protective. Here's a close-up of the seal itself with our winged goddess. I could show you dozens of cylinder seals, but instead let me just tell you that images of such goddesses were well known in pre and early Greek history. In fact, some of the Mesopotamian seal cylinders have been found in pre-Greek or Mycenaean tombs, in other words, in the lands that are now called Greece. Um, but for now, I'm going to jump right to the amazing Bernie relief, um, also called the Queen of the Night relief. This is a Mesopotamian or Old Babylonian terracotta plaque. It's excavated from what was apparently a shrine to a goddess in a private home in southern Iraq in the 1930s acquired by the British Museum in 2003. I can't do this old Babylonian relief justice in just a few minutes, and we don't know who this winged goddess is, 
She could be the goddess Ishtar or her sister Ereshkigal. But notice the birds of prey, in this case, not hawks, but owls. And notice the talons and the lions over which this powerful goddess has absolute control. A teacher of mine named Nano Marinatos has described Circe as the direct descendant of goddesses like the queen of the night, the unknown goddess in the Bernie relief. Others are less willing to connect so many disparate dots across Mesopotamia and the ancient Mediterranean over so many centuries. But the Circe scholar Judith Yarnall, in reference to this image of the queen of the night, wrote, her beauty like Circe's is finely balanced against her ability to inspire terror. In this close up, you can see traces of red paint on her hand the apparently sacred rod and ring symbol in her raised hand is outside my area of expertise, but the website of the British Museum provides a lot of bibliography. So this brings us back to Circe. I don't think that the lack of clothing is a reference to what's going to happen with Odysseus. Instead, the nudity is a powerful symbol of control. This is why there's no direct confrontation between Odysseus and Circe here. After reading Madeline Miller's novel, I understand this cup. It's not about Odysseus. Yes, it's Homeric. I think this is Odysseus on the left coming to the rescue, a little late, and Eurylochus exiting in search of Odysseus at the right. But I should have understood this cup better years ago when I had a student who gave a great title to a paper about Odysseus. Amy's title was, You're So Vain, You Probably Think This Paper's About You. This face painter would have liked the novel Circe. Odysseus is just an episode. This five inch masterpiece is about Circe. In the center, we have the goddess named Hawk, strong, naked, full of erotic and magical power, and her magic is working. Thank you. If anyone has any questions, feel free to put those in the chat window. I thought that was fascinating. Thank you so much, Dr. Gordon. Um, we'll just see if we have any questions rolling. Okay, is there anything known about the materials for these vessels? Um, yeah, yeah, sure, a lot. Um, so they're terracotta, they're made of clay, and um, all of the vessels I showed you were made in Athens, and um, a, a lot of them have been tested so that we know it's local Athenian clay. Um, some of them we know were actually used um, for food. Um, a lot of the vases that we have, in, sometimes we call them vases. I like to call them pots. Um, they're all different kinds of things. They, um, they weren't vases likely to hold flowers. They held things like olive oil and wine and other food. Um, they, a lot of the, the vases that we have um, that are well preserved come from tombs in Italy, the, the Etruscans, the, the um, ancient peoples living um, in Italy, um, contemporary with fifth century Greeks, imported a whole lot of Greek pot pottery. They loved it. They decorated their tombs with it. In some ways, they may have been equipping themselves for the afterlife, but um, we have, I think, excellent evidence that Etruscans also imported the um, Greek pottery for everyday use because some of them um, wind up in tombs after being mended. So I think that they did use them for parties and things like that. Um, great question. Um, and I will throw these two together. Um, can you please repeat where the Naked Circe Cup is now? And can you also recommend some uh, museums where our attendees yes. could explore more digitally? Yes, yes. Well, why don't we go ahead and pull up the PowerPoint then. So if you just go um, to um, around slide five, let's see, oh dear, my other computer just turned off, but... Um, so if, if you just go to the title page of the video that shows the Circe pot and then, and go to, um, yeah, keep going. Just 
there, right there. So this is in Boston. And um, the Boston Museum of Fine Arts is a great place to look at the pots. Um, currently, they don't have a whole lot of them on display, um, even though the museum just reopened this week. But their website is fabulous. And so you just Google Museum of Fine Arts and search collections. And um, you can search by the name of a mythological figure. So you can just search for Circe. And um, this will, will show, um, will just pop right up there for you. Um, and um, a lot of the, the images are in common domain, but um, the, the Boston Museum of Fine Arts gives permission to use um, copyrighted material for um, educational talks like, like this one. Um, so if, if you wanna look at Greek art online, um, Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. And so if we just go um, to one of the other slides, you can see some of the other museums and the British Museum in London has a great website for looking at things in collections. Um, well, the, so there's a great big one, a great big wine crater coming up that is in New York. This one, so this is in New York by the Persephone painter. Um, and um, this is about 14 inches tall and it was actually used for um, mixing wine, water, possibly honey. Um, the Greeks had different taste in wine. Um, so yeah. Was there, a, did I answer the-, the, the Yeah, the I think that's great. Um, we let's, I'm just looking to see. You have already kind of talked about um, a lot of the uses for these pots and vases, um, oil, mixing wine and honey. Were there any other things that they used them for? Carrying water. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if you think of um, the lack of Greek plumbing, um, it's, it was sort of a cliche that uh, so-called respectable Greek young woman, um, maybe didn't get that many times that she could leave the house. Some people think this is, this is, um, but, uh, well, it's like, it, it's a cliche, um, in scholarship, at least that, a, a, a nice girl didn't get to leave the house unless she had to go get the water and you would carry, um, great, jugs of water on your head or on your shoulder, and it was a way to get out. Um, of course, I don't really think that women all stayed home the way that uh, I, was, I was taught in college, that Greek women stayed home. And it was the men who, who got to go out and live life. I, I think that there was really serious gender polarization in Greece, but I think a lot of it um, depended also on a lot of, um, ideology that wasn't necessarily representing reality. Um, somebody asked if there were um, Greek vases at KU, and we do have some in the Wilcox Classical Collection, our small classics museum on campus. Um, and you can also check out the website, just search for Wilcox Classical Collection at KU. We've got some great little pots, um, nothing as grand as this one that's on the screen right now, but we have some, some excellent examples and our students even sometimes get to um, look at the pots outside of the cases and get a sense of, of how wonderful they are to hold. There are also some in Kansas City. Kansas City has a nice collection of Greek vases. Um, okay. Someone is asking about the book mentioned by your mentor. So I'll go find that slide. Um, while maybe you can address, was Circe a common image used or was it more rare? Um, 
Not, so it's not that common. Um, there is a database of um, published vases and uh, it's a database at the Beasley archive um, at Oxford and they list 23 vases that have CRC on them. Um, and uh, the, there are just a few more. I, I've shown the main Athenian CRCs that have good images, um, but, but there are 23 pots in total in, in the Beasley database. Um, we don't really know. It used to be um, that these things were purchased by museums with not enough questions asked so that we don't always know where pots come from. Um, a lot of them are from Etruscan tombs, in other words, um, you know, pre-Italian um, cultures. And um, they may have had interest in the myth of Circe because she's associated with the underworld. So if they're decorating tombs, they might want to choose um, artwork for the tomb or utensils for the tomb that have um, images of things associated with the underworld. But we're not, we're not really sure. There are, there are tens of thousands of Greek pots though and just 23 Circe vases. Um, will you also talk about the seal jar again? Uh, what was it? This, yes, it's cylinder seal. Sure. Um, let me see if I can find um, that slide. So these, these are just little tiny um, cylinder seals. It's just a little tiny cylinder that would be rolled across something. If you think of, just imagine sealing um, a tablet or something with wax. Um, and so it's, it's a little cylinder, you would roll it across um, mud or wax and it would make an impression. Um, people use them as we think um, signatures, you know, proof of ownership. Um, and um, yeah. It, I think it, it expressed could it, it was a good way to express your 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 power to have a powerful goddess and and a weather god on your your cylinder seal. And they, they, so this this is from Syria, um, so it, it's Mesopotamian, but a lot of these have been found in Greece and for um, some sometimes contemporary. Um, so there are, are tombs in Greece contemporary with this um, type of cylinder seal, um, but they would also be found centuries later, we think, um, although um, uh, I'm not up on all of the, the data on exactly where everything was found. It, it, is, it is one of the, the, the terrible things about um, especially 19th century, 18th and 19th century museum collection. Oh, and even 20th century. Um, we, we so seldom know enough about where things are found and we'd really like to know more about context rather than just have the beautiful item. Uh, yeah, for sure. The, um, there's a question about sharing your video. Uh, with our attendees tonight. We will, we are recording this and so we will plan to archive it on our um, YouTube channel for Big Read. Um, but Dr. Gordon, do you have any interest in sharing your video? Sure, I, I find and I, I think um, I, I, I'm not allowed to sell the video. Um, you're, we're not allowed to make money from these images, but I have followed all of the guidelines on their on the museum websites about about using the images. So as long as nobody tries to um, profit from mm -hmm. the the images, it's 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 fine if you would like to let let people um, have a copy of the video. We will, um, we would have to, there's some considerations for um, 
uh, like actually physically sharing it uh -huh. um, because it is a large file. So it may be best if we just direct people to our YouTube channel. Sorry, I was not prepared to answer that question. Okay, that sounds great. <laughs> okay. Um, do you know if we have any uh, examples of other mythological women portrayed in this way, naked and perhaps demonstrating power on pottery, uh, perhaps other Olympians? Well, Aphrodite. Um, but I guess we expect nakedness with Aphrodite because that we know that um, I, since she is a goddess of erotic desire, then the nakedness makes more sense there. Um, but gosh, in uh, of the Greek goddesses, no, I'm thinking uh, it's Circe and Aphrodite who, who come to mind. Um, do you know if we have any of this art here in Wichita? Uh, I don't know. We have a Museum of World Treasures. They're um, actually in this, the Beanstack Challenge. We invite you to go visit them and look for one of their faces. I think it's a red figure painting, a red figure vase. Is that the right term? Uh -huh. um, anyway, and so you should check that out. But I don't know if it, it most likely doesn't have Circe. And then um, any relationship to Indian and Middle Eastern Asian ancient art? Middle Eastern, yes. Yes, so um, what, what I'm calling Mesopotamia. Um, so um, yes, definitely. The, um, and Greek culture was heavily influenced by ancient Near Eastern and Egyptian art. Um, they had they had a lot. There was a lot of communication across the Mediterranean and, and through the ancient Near East. So um, well, there was a lot of cultural exchange. Were the pots found in the conditions shown here? No, usually not. There, um, some occasionally things are found in excellent condition, but they they very often have to be. Um, pieced back together. Um, there, of course, there are, um, you know, terrible stories of, you know, really crimes committed by antiquities dealers. Sometimes there, there, there have been indications of uh, that sometimes ancient art, um, ancient vases have been found intact and then they're deliberately broken so that, um, a museum can acquire a piece of a vase and then miraculously the museum was able to buy further pieces um, over the years. So that, um, um, and these things were done um, so that museums didn't want to be accused of looting tombs, but apparently there, there um, have been a lot, there has been looting. Um, so um, I'm I'm in, in favor of keeping antiquities in their, their home countries where where they're found. But it, it I also am happy that I have been able in my life to see a lot of these even in, in Boston and New York and Athens. Uh, what kind of paint did they use? Um, you know I don't know um, the so the. Um, the some of the glazes are made from clay, but I don't I don't know very much about about glazes and, and paints. Um, so I'm not sure at all. It's a great question. Well, we have um, shared our um, link to the survey. Our um, evaluation for today's program in the chat window. So I would invite everybody to um, take a look at that. Uh, let's see here, where would the largest collection of this kind of um, pottery art be? Um, the Louvre, so when in Paris, see Greek pots at the Louvre, um, definitely British Museum, um, 
definitely um, the Vatican museums. Some of the um, wonderful Greek pots that have um, been returned to Italy from places like Cleveland, Malibu, um, and I think Boston are now in Rome at the Villa Giulia. So you can um, see some of the Greek pots reunited with Etruscan artworks from actual Etruscan tombs. Um, so I, it, Rome is a great place to go see Greek pottery also. Great, any other questions? a little bit. Um, but thank you, Dr. Gordon. Uh, it was really a fascinating talk. We've got great audiences here in Wichita. I have learned so much. I, I really love people's questions and it's, it's been a wonderful experience. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, um, if there are no other questions, I'm seeing a lot of thank yous roll in, um, which we will definitely share with um, Dr. Gordon following the presentation. But I will uh, hand it over to Julie to um, take us out. Thank you.